Thank you, everyone, for coming out this evening. It's great to see so many, so many people. Our topic today, living with atrial fibrillation, everyday strategies for patients and families. Few of my disclosures. A disclaimer, this presentation is for broad informational purposes. We're not providing specific recommendations to you for your specific um, situation without knowing you better. So this is a broad informational session to allow you to know what is available, what is the latest on the topic of atrial fibrillation, to fuel your own research consideration of your condition, and for us to talk about in greater detail in the office. So atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation matters. And why does atrial fibrillation matter? Because two things can happen. You can have symptoms that you don't want, feel badly in a way that you don't want, either the feeling of your heart racing or flip-flopping around or simply a profound fatigue. Symptoms due to atrial fibrillation are very disturbing. And second of all, stroke. Atrial fibrillation predisposes each person with atrial fibrillation to stroke, and we want to avoid that potentially devastating consequence at all costs. So symptoms and stroke, the two cornerstones of our focus for atrial fibrillation. Here's a recent patient that I met several months ago, age 88, Mrs. R, happily enjoying retirement, was on her back porch swinging, enjoying the sunshine, when suddenly this happened. Stroke. Retirement, life as you know it, suddenly over, brought to hospital, and for the first time we diagnosed atrial fibrillation on her ECG. We know that 36% of strokes in our population age 80 and above are due to atrial fibrillation, and strokes due to atrial fibrillation are more disabling, more likely to recur, and more likely to be fatal than strokes due to other causes. So this is something that we have to be very aware of and particularly careful about if atrial fibrillation does occur in us or in somebody we know and who is close to us. So it begs the question, what exactly is atrial fibrillation? So here we have schematics of the heart. On the left panel, we have a normal heart. We see that as the normal heart beats, we have the electrical impulse travel across the top chamber, conducts then to the bottom chamber, which contracts in a nice synchronized fas fashion, pumping blood to your body. During atrial fibrillation, the activity in the top chambers of your heart is chaotic and disorganized occurring in all directions all at once at very rapid rates, and this bombards the bottom chamber, which also contract rapidly and irregularly at a slower rate, but that's gonna be our definition of atrial fibrillation, where here we have this nice heart rhythm, top chamber, bottom chamber contracting, a little rest, top, bottom, rest, top, bottom, rest. That's a nice organized rhythm. In atrial fibrillation, we see the bottom chamber contracting in a way that we call irregularly irregular. There's no pattern to it. It. And that's because it's driven by that chaotic activity in the top chamber. And it is on an ECG by looking at this that we make the clinical diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. Typically, the heart rate is elevated, but it is not always elevated. It's really that irregularity that tells us that atrial fibrillation is present and we had better pay attention. So the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, again, with an electrocardiogram. Many of us, including myself, have had an electrocardiogram. Here we see a gentleman hooked up to these leads, and his tracing is recorded. And this electrocardiogram shows atrial fibrillation. How do you know? Because you recognize that irregularly irregular pattern, that seeming randomness. And if you look closely in between those major heartbeats, we see this evidence of this very disorganized activity that is occurring in the top chamber of the heart. So this is how we, we make the diagnosis. So then you ask yourself, well, do I have atrial fibrillation? Good question. How do you feel if you have atrial fibrillation? Your symptoms can be non-existent, you don't even know, to severe. Classically, the symptoms are palpitations. So your heart, you feel that your heart is racing. You feel that it's irregular. People feel it beating against their chest or like it's gonna jump out of their chest. Some people will say it's like a fish flopping in my chest. I call those the classic symptoms. The most common symptom is in point of fact, just a profound fatigue. 
we're all tired, and everyone says, well, I'm getting older, there's reason for me to feel tired, but it's this level of fatigue that's superimposed on your life that shouldn't be there, and it's due to atrial fibrillation, and you know that it shouldn't be there because you know that really your health is, is much better than that. Um, it's like running a marathon that never ends because the heart is going much faster than um, it would be otherwise. Symptoms of shortness of breath, all, that, all of that being said, I still meet individuals who truly are asymptomatic. They feel fine, they can't tell, but truly the rhythm is atrial fibrillation, and in those individuals, the consequences of atrial fibrillation are still present. And of course, for them, our focus becomes the stroke risk. So again, do I have atrial fibrillation? People tell me all the time, well, I have this funny feeling in my chest from time to time, and I wonder if that is perhaps atrial fibrillation. We know from studies that symptoms can be unreliable, so the sensation that you're having may or may not be, we really need to record your rhythm, 95% of atrial fibrillation episodes are in fact asymptomatic. Suspicious symptoms, you think this is AFib, are incorrectly attributed to atrial fibrillation in 85% of cases. And even in individuals known to have symptomatic episodes of AFib, we know it bothers them. We know they have the real thing. Still, 12 times of their episodes will, in fact, be asymptomatic, and they won't know that they're occurring, even in the people who are really bothered. Um, so you start to understand that this becomes a diagnostic dilemma, and it's a challenge for you, and it's a challenge for your doctor. So, so the question again, do I have atrial fibrillation? People who tend to overestimate their burden are those who also have anxiety, tend to overestimate, and also people who suffer from depression. Those who tend to underestimate atrial fibrillation, we've learned, are folks with increased age and also the female gender. So you can kind of judge maybe what your estimate of atrial fibrillation is based on those factors. And again, serious consequences, five-fold increased risk of stroke. Now, like we've said already, 36% of stroke in the age 80 to 89 cohort, which happens to be the fastest growing demographic in the United States. Strokes more disabling, more likely to recur, more likely to be fatal. Three-fold increased risk of heart failure, two-fold increased risk of heart attack, two-fold increased risk of dementia, and two-fold increased risk of early death due to atrial fibrillation. And why is that? Here is your heart. If the top chamber is not contracting, the blood sits still. And if the blood sits still, clots can form. And when clots form, those clots then get pumped to your body. Some of those major arteries going straight to your brain. Clots lodge in your brain, cause blockages, and this is your stroke. And this is the risk, really, that is due to atrial fibrillation that we have to be so careful about. So then people ask me, well, why do I have atrial fibrillation? I've been healthy, I've lived a good life, I'm still slim and trim. We have risk factors, hypertension, obesity, sleep apnea, hyperthyroid, use of alcohol or drugs, um, prior illnesses that you've had, which result in scar tissue forming in your heart as the years go by in response to injury due to illnesses, whether it be the common cold or a flu or things of this nature, all predispose your chamber to atrial fibrillation, which tends to manifest as the decades accumulate. Because these things will cause the chamber to dilate, hypertrophy, fibrosis will form between the muscle bundles, all electrically destabilizing your heart rhythm, which can lead to atrial fibrillation. And this is a topic that I studied mechanistically as a PhD student many years ago, very interested in how these complex rhythms could actually support themselves in your heart. And now we've moved on in our careers to helping people actually deal with these challenging rhythms and finding the best solution for each person. For some people, it's maintaining normal rhythm. For other people, it's just slowing down the heart. In almost all cases, it's providing adequate anticoagulation so that stroke risk is minimized. And we'll cover each of these points. So it's a huge problem, and it's growing fast. Three million people in America right now have atrial fibrillation. We expect that to be over 12 million by the year 2050. It's 5% of the population over 65, 10% over 75. It's like the latest epidemic, kind of like high blood pressure or diabetes. There's just scores of people out there who have these conditions, and atrial fibrillation is becoming one of those. 
Can we screen people for this? A single ECG or a pulse check would detect atrial fibrillation in 1.4% of people age 65 if they were to pay attention and have those tests either in a doctor's office or a pharmacy. So it's the real deal. Understanding your atrial fibrillation. Suppose we've diagnosed you with atrial fibrillation, you've supported, you reported your symptoms to your doctor, he recorded an ECG. In point of fact, we did see atrial fibrillation. Where do we go from there? A question that immediately becomes relevant is can we monitor for atrial fibrillation? How can we know what your heart rhythm is doing at every point in time? We use in our clinic a lot of these ambulatory monitors, and you can wear these for up to 30 days. It's three stickers on your chest and a hip pack, and this will analyze your heart rhythm, every beat of your heart, and will report to us exactly how much atrial fibrillation you're having during that monitoring period and how fast your heart goes during atrial fibrillation compared to normal. And this can help us tremendously to guide your, your treatment. We have patches that just stick to you like large band-aids. They're usually good for a week or so, and um, with those patches, we can analyze what your rhythm is during that time period. And if you're having symptoms, that funny feeling in your chest, you just press a button and that monitor will pay attention that this is what's bothering you and we can tell if it is in fact an abnormal rhythm that is, is underlying your symptoms. So the, the business of monitoring is big business. And this is one of my favorites. It's the implantable loop recorder. This little device, the size of a, the size of a paper clip, we can slip it under the skin right over top of your heart, and it will monitor, sense every beat of your heart for three years. And you can report symptoms to that device. With a little wand, you click when you're having a symptom, it records whatever's happening, and we can correlate your symptoms with rhythm abnormalities and then guide you appropriately in terms of what therapy should be appropriate. The emphasis today on the implantable monitors is the ease of implant. And here we show a picture from one of our um, implants of a cardiac monitor where the idea is to stay very superficial. This insertion tool is just advanced under the skin, which has been you know, anesthetized. And then we simply slip the monitor under the skin, very superficial, seal it up with a drop of glue, go home 30 minutes later, every beat of your heart, we will know for the next three years the business of cardiac monitoring. You get a device that sits beside your bed at night, and um, this is the device that sits beside your bed. It will automatically interact with your device every night, push alerts to our office if it sees something suspicious, something that we've programmed it to recognize and to report to us. I get nice reports like this in my office that tell me, oh, here we've gone month to month, no atrial fibrillation, and oops, there's a four hour episode, and then nothing for months, and oh, there's a six hour, and then a four hour episode. We see these things, and we can advise you um, appropriately when we're able to understand what your heart rhythm is and how much atrial fibrillation any one person may be, ha ha may be having. So then we classify these ryth rhythms as paroxysmal, meaning they come and go. If your episodes are less than seven days, we'll call it persistent. If your episodes are lasting longer than seven days, and kind of if you're always in it 12 months or more, it's longstanding or permanent, and we'll make treatment decisions based on the burden of the atrial fibrillation that you're having. It's easier to keep you in normal rhythm when you are in fact having paroxysmal episodes, meaning they come and go, because as you can imagine, they're vulnerable to stopping on their own. When they become persistent and they're always there, it's more of a challenge. Um, however, we take those on and we are very successful in many cases. Okay, so we've talked about monitoring. We can tell what your heart rhythm is at any point in time. Um, we've talked about how to diagnose atrial fibrillation, our symptoms, what we may feel, what we may not feel. What can we do? What can be done about atrial fibrillation? So we, we, we think of a management triad, and this is what I have in my mind with every atrial fibrillation patient I meet. Our first priority is stroke prevention. We'll talk about that. The next consideration is rate control. Is your heart going too fast during episodes of atrial fibrillation? If, it's so, if that's so, we work on slowing you down, and that reduces the symptoms um, tremendously. And then the final consideration is rhythm control. What is our likelihood of keeping you in normal rhythm from preventing atrial fibrillation, and is that going to be our treatment strategy? And if it is, you know, how many steps, how aggressive are we going to be to achieve adequate um, rhythm control? So touching on stroke prevention first, 
And this is the business of blood thinning medications. So we have anticoagulation for stroke prevention. It's the best and only way to prevent strokes due to atrial fibrillation. And when you are on a proper blood thinner, your stroke risk approaches that of the general population. So the protection um, is really very good. Do you need anticoagulation? Most people don't want to be on blood thinners, and we actually use a risk scoring system to tell what your population-based risk is of having a stroke from atrial fibrillation, and we make the decision that way. So based on your medical history, you know, are you age above 75? Do you have high blood pressure? Are we treating you for high blood pressure? Are we treating you for diabetes? Have you had a stroke? Do you have known vascular disease else elsewhere? Are you female? We know that females are higher risk. You get a point for each of those things. We add those together and you get a maximum score of nine. Then we go to this chart and we say, what is your score, zero to nine, and we can tell you what your percent risk is per year of having stroke due to atrial fibrillation. So then based on your percent risk, provided that the episodes of AFib are long enough, we'll make a decision for blood thinners. When you're low risk, aspirin may be enough, and when you're higher risk, we go to stronger levels of anticoagulation. Previously, for most of your lives, certainly for my training, the only strong blood thinner we had was warfarin. Warfarin has its challenges. We now have newer agents, particularly Xeralto and Eliquis, which are my favorites, um, very good at providing protection, far more convenient, much better safety profiles. In spite of the commercials that you see on TV, believe me, these have been transformational in our, in our management of atrial fibrillation, and we'll talk about those. Some advantages to warfarin, and it, and it is very good if it's what you're on and if it's what's appropriate for you. It is effective, it is inexpensive. You can use it in settings such as hemodialysis or if you have a mechanical heart valve. Disadvantages are it takes several days to start it. You do have an increased bleed risk. You have to monitor the level, so you're always having your INR checked, and that means trips into the Coumadin clinic every week or couple of weeks, months, once you get stable. Um, the time that you actually spend in the therapeutic range on warfarin is about 60%. So when you're below that, you're unprotected, and when you're above it, your risk is increased. And it changes with your medications, with your food, if you're ill or well. Um, green leafy vegetables, as we know, will um, desensitize you from warfarin. So there's challenges in using, in using warfarin. My favorites now are the novel oral anticoagulants. We think of Xeralto and Eliquis. So advantages are all the protection of warfarin. You get protection from hours after your first dose. There's less bleed risk, particularly less risk of the very dangerous bleeds like brain bleeds that concern us so much. Um, there's no monitoring of the blood thinning level, and it's not even possible. There is possibility of reversing these agents, which is um, very helpful. And it's also protecting you from pulmonary embolus or deep vein thrombosis. Many of you know, patients with atrial fibrillation also have had these other clotting problems, and those medications will cover um, each of these concerns. Disadvantages is the price tends to be a little bit higher, but it's getting much better, and there tends to be an increased risk of having a GI bleed. So if you're particularly vulnerable in your, in your um, gastrointestinal tract, that's something to think about. Um, but in general, even for folks who are a little bit predisposed, um, the safety profile overall because of the reduced intracranial hemorrhage or brain bleeds is very convincing and a good reason to think seriously about being on one of these agents. So that's stroke prevention. Once, you've, once we've prevented you from, once we've protected you from, from your stroke risk, the next consideration is your symptoms. How are we going to make you feel better? For many people, this is an issue of slowing down the heart rate. And for that, we call this rate control. So we move on to rate control. When you're having atrial fibrillation, we want your heart rate to be adequate so you feel as well as possible. And this is where we use medications such as beta blockers. We've heard of metoprolol or toprol. We use the calcium channel blockers such as diltiazem. Um, digoxin's been around a long time or amiodarone medications that are often indicated for other heart conditions. The beta blockers, I describe them as being giant lozenges for your heart, blunt the stress response to your heart so your heart doesn't get so revved up um, when your system is being challenged. And we can be very effective in controlling your heart rate during atrial fibrillation. 
and I get so much information from my monitors. We have an implantable monitor, for example. This is patient data. So here, because it's continuous, I see 92 days worth of data. And during that time, when this individual was in normal rhythm, I get this beautiful plot of what the heart rates were in normal rhythm, percent of the time spent at each heart rate, and this looks like a very normal, relatively active person. Of those 92 days, one day was spent in atrial fibrillation, and during that time, the heart rates were very fast. You know, most above 100 beats a minute, often above 140 beats a minute. So our rate control during atrial fibrillation here is unsatisfactory, and it's something that we want to work on. The overall rhythm control is pretty good. It's only one day in 92, um, but the rate control we can improve on. So for rate control, we pay attention to that. Moving on finally to what is, I think, the most exciting area of atrial fibrillation management is rhythm control. How do we keep you in normal rhythm? And can we keep you in normal rhythm so that the atrial fibrillation isn't occurring, hopefully so that your risk of stroke goes down with even the possibility of coming off of blood thinning medications if we can assure ourselves that we have adequately controlled your heart rhythm and kept you in normal rhythm. So the first line of treatment above the rate control medications that we've talked about are the specific classes of antiarrhythmics. How many people in the audience have been on an antiarrhythmic medication? We have several hands, numerous hands. This is our attempt to keep you in normal rhythm. This is rhythm control. So for paroxysmal AFib, when your AFib comes and goes, our first line are what we call the class one drugs. Flecainide, propafenone are good examples. You have to have a structurally normal heart and no significant blockages in the arteries to your heart to be eligible for the class ones. But in those individuals, they work very well. If you are having persistent atrial fibrillation, we move on to what we call the class threes. And classical examples of that would be sotalol. And one I use in very resistant cases frequently is dofetilide or ticosin. So in the persistent arrhythmia to keep you in normal rhythm. You can have structural heart disease and use these medications. You can have blockages in your arteries and use these medications. What they do require is that your kidney function is adequate and that certain electrical intervals on your ECG are sufficiently short. If they're too long, these can become dangerous. So we have to be assured of that. Assured of that. But when we are assured of that, um, these can be very effective. And I'm happy to work with anyone on finding the dose that's best for any one individual and then proving that the medication has or has not worked so we can be certain what your rhythm control is and what exactly um, we have achieved for you. Beyond medications, and believe me, I know people don't want to be on medications. Usually they're very well tolerated, but we just don't like it. And frequently there's certain other side effects that we just don't feel right or we'd rather not be off. Or when we come off, we find out that we do feel a little bit better. And um, people don't like to be on medications, and I understand that. So for rhythm control, what is the next and final step really for um, controlling your atrial fibrillation? And that is catheter ablation. This is a procedure that I specialize in, that I pride myself in tremendously. It's um, a catheter-based procedure, like I tell my patients. We have you in the hospital. You are laying flat on a table. We go into the veins of your groin with catheters. These are very thin tubes like spaghetti, very electrical, electrically sensitive. Run them up into your heart, position them in your heart. We can study the electrical activity of your heart. And then with one of those catheters, we can apply heat energy, which is a cauterizing energy, to disrupt um, the foci which are, which, which are causing the atrial fibrillation in the top chambers of your heart. For atrial fibrillation, most of it is coming from your left atrium. The catheters go up your venous side into your right atrium. So we actually cross the little thin wall separating those two chambers into the left atrium, thin your blood while we're doing that so our catheters don't cause stroke, and then really diligently search out in that chamber for the sites, the locations that are driving your atrial fibrillation, and we try to neutralize those thoroughly. When we're done, everything comes out. We wake you up because we did it under general anesthesia. You spend one night overnight in hospital and should go home the next day feeling fine. For the first three months, we're going to excuse any atrial fibrillation that occurs because the procedure is still maturing, and it's really beyond the three months that we look for success. 
So stay on your blood thinners until we've proven that we're successful, and then we'll think about coming off of them based on your risk score and our certainty of success um, at a later date. But this is catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation. Usually we do some cardiac imaging before the procedure, either a CT scan or an MRI, to learn the size and shape of your atria to allow us to do the best procedure for you because there are plenty of interperson variability in the size and shape of heart chambers, and we want to get the best result for you. So that begins with imaging. So you get a scan, and the image on the left is what we will obtain, um, and that's the shape of this um, one person's uh, atrial that we will use to guide our procedure. So the CT scan is like this, and we will de de deconstruct these images one by one, going through the various structures surrounding the heart and which are part of the heart to isolate just your left atrium because we know that the veins bringing blood back from your lungs into your left atrium, there are four of them, are like jet engines of electrical activity that fire and they'll put that chamber into AFib and it's really neutralizing that activity that is the cornerstone of our ablation procedure. Then we look for other hot spots that are contributing to atrial fibrillation in you and target those as well, but really it's those pulmonary veins that are our primary focus and are most important and we want to know exactly their anatomy and orientation and use so that we can neutralize them uh, most effectively during our procedures. So for that catheter that can apply the heat energy, this is what it looks like. It's a very sophisticated device. Um, this tip will heat. There's a transducer that lets us know exactly how hard we're pushing on the wall of the heart so we know we're being effective but not dangerous, very important. Out of these ports comes saline that's irrigating the tip of that catheter. It makes the ablation lesions more effective. We can see those on our x-ray screen. They look like this when they're in your heart. Here's that catheter. The tip on our x-ray screen looks like this. And this, the entire procedure is conduct, conducted with you suspended in an uh, electrical field where we can recreate your heart on our computer mapping system. So we see the size and shape of your chamber. It helps us plan where exactly the hot spots are in your heart that are driving atrial fibrillation so that for you, for your unique procedure, we can neutralize those as effectively as possible, and we know exactly where we've been, what we've done, and what we've achieved as part of our procedure to make it successful. It's very exciting, and this technology is moving at warp speed, as you can imagine, and it's getting better, it feels almost, almost monthly. But we've had some real breakthroughs within the last year, especially that contact force sensing catheter, which has really transformed our ablations. Um, the energy we apply, we know it's more effective. As a result, we have to do less of it. We accomplish more, better success, better safety for you, better results. Um, the field is moving fast, and it is truly very exciting uh, to even be a part of it. So how much work we do in your heart will depend on your pattern of atrial fibrillation. If you are paroxysmal, like I said, we are simply isolating and neutralizing those four veins. Then as your clinical pattern that you come to us with increases to persistent, for example, we will do more work, identifying more hot spots throughout the heart as well as doing the veins and potentially a different additional manipulations that we feel are gonna be effective in you and will do the most work if you come to us in a long-standing pattern and really desire atrial fibrillation ablation. We can have good results in all cases. I actually find the long-standings and the persistence on the most interesting procedurally because it is a little bit more of a, of a challenge for us to get a good result and we enjoy that challenge. Um, but we can ab ablate for atrial fibrillation in each of those situations very appropriately and truly expect to have some remarkable results. And this is what those ablations would look like on our computer mapping system. Here is the left atrium reconstructed on the computer system for this patient and it has documented with these red dots each of the ablation points that we have delivered as we go around you know, each of the four veins and neutralize um, those pulmonary vein insertions electrically. We have had a nationally recognized program developed and pioneered some novel techniques for ablation of atrial fibrillation and been able to write those up and share those with the arrhythmia community and with folks 
performing these procedures um, nationally, even internationally, and has some good recognition. It's been well appreciated by other operators. It makes us feel and lets us know that we are on the cutting edge and that what we're doing is really very good and at a very high level. And um, it's exciting for us, very rewarding, and we enjoy it. And this is the sort of technology, um, the sort of skill and expertise that we want to bring to your case or to someone you know should um, you or someone uh, you know find yourself in our ablation laboratory. And I know there's a number of my patients here um, who we have ablated in the past and a number of success stories here. And we're anticipating um, many more of those in the months and years to come. There's another technology, a cooling technology that will freeze around those veins, can also perform that electrical isolation, and that can also be um, effective in the correct patient. So rhythm control, how does that look like on one of our monitors? Here again, we see a patient who was in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Here's 12 hours per day. And before their ablation, we see that they were indeed having episodes of atrial fibrillation several hours at a time, up to 10 hours on this day. This is as the month, months go by, October, October, November. We perform an ablation. There's several significant episodes of AFib following. And we expect that as the heart can be a little bit irritable immediately following the procedure. And then exactly what we were hoping for, and that is silence. No atrial fibrillation as the months go by. True freedom. And, as long as the, and then we feel confident that we can start to stop the medications, see that there continues to be no atrial fibrillation. And should that be the case, even stop the blood thinning medications in the right patient and truly declare you um, free from this very problematic heart rhythm. So this is rhythm control. Other conditions which are frequently associated with atrial fibrillation. If you go fast because you have atrial fibrillation, when you're in normal rhythm, frequently the heart will go too slow. And this is a problem for many of our patients. We call this the tachybrady or the fast slow syndrome. We recognize this and we're prepared to treat it appropriately. The best treatment for tachybrady is, of course, a pacemaker. I prefer in these situations a certain brand of pacemaker, which I think most reproduces or best reproduces the heart rate that your body truly wants. And it does that by sensing the forcefulness of the contraction of your heart and understanding what heart rate should correspond to that and providing that to you. If your heart rates are normalized when you are in normal rhythm, our data shows us that the incidence of atrial fibrillation goes down. So we see that protective, as protective. People feel better because their heart rates are normal. You get more blood flow, you feel more energetic, you sleep better. So those are all great things. Also, your atrial fibrillation will drop. The pacemaker becomes a long-term monitor, which will report to us all the atrial fibrillation that you're having, and we can understand it better. And that will allow us to guide your therapy. Once we've gone to the pacemaker, the other forms of monitoring becomes obsolete because this is the ultimate monitor. So the tachybrady syndrome, something to um, certainly be aware of. Here's someone with most of their heart rates below 60 beats a minute. This is in quite an elderly gentleman, 90 years of age. He receives a pacemaker. Now he's nothing less than 60 beats a minute. And his body chooses to have heart rates that are significantly higher as he goes about his day and his normal activities. And it's the pacemaker now that is sensing those and providing them for him. And that can be really transformational in people who truly suffer from this condition. So we're quick to um, recognize it and to provide appropriate therapy. We have pacemakers that can treat atrial fibrillation. They're monitoring that rhythm. When they see sequences that are adequately organized, they'll pace into that rhythm and try to interrupt it. It works sometimes. So the pacemaker can put you out of atrial fibrillation for the correct person. It's hard to know who that's going to be, but sometimes for the tachybrady syndrome, we'll put in these pacemakers. And for select individuals, we'll see that um, technology work remarkably well. So we're aware of that. And it's interesting as the companies you know, give us improved therapies for um, our patients that um, the pacemakers can actually be involved in, in treating these complicated rhythms. A few examples of what our therapy for atrial fibrillation may look like, rhythm control achieved with um, Tikison therapy, and um, that's our class three um, antiarrhythmic drug, and later, with, and later with ablation, 
64-year-old man, coronary disease prior stent, atrial fibrillation, can't tell he's having it, debilitating fatigue. We put him on Ticasin. He went from 100% atrial fibrillation, our monitor tells us, down to 35%. His heart rates are relatively fast at atrial fibrillation. Of that 35%, the monitor tells us that most of his episodes are starting at 9 o'clock at night. And his wife is like, that's it. That's exactly when I lose him. He'll kind of fade, loses his energy. Nine o'clock at night, quite reliably. And we're like, sure enough, most of your episodes are starting at that time. So we have symptom rhythm correlation from the monitor. We know that in you, it is the atrial fibrillation that's responsible for your fatigue. Gives us more motivation to go after that rhythm. So we brought this gentleman in for his ablation procedure. This is what his looked like, the model of his heart. You see our ablation lesions going around the pulmonary veins, additional hot spots in his heart. And here during ablation, as his heart beats along, it suddenly stopped. He goes in a normal rhythm. We couldn't get it started. Um, if, for um, Try as we may, as hard as we could try, not get this patient to fibrillate anymore. And on his monitor, truly, here is all of his patchy atrial fibrillation on the Tikasin therapy with ablation. It stops, never to be seen again. And um, he feels fantastic, able to de-escalate his medications, able to come off of his blood thinner. We can prove that he's safe because he has a monitor in place. This is the kind of success that we really like to see for our patients and for those who are truly um, suffering from this very challenging rhythm. And it's a result I cannot guarantee, we can never guarantee, but we have many examples of success. Even following an ablation for atrial fibrillation, if you continue to have some, you tend to be less symptomatic from it, so you still feel better, and patients, even if they're continuing to have some, often f are appreciative that they did have the procedure. Usually you are having less, even if you're having some breakthrough. So you have less, you feel better, got to stay on your blood thinner. And for the right person, we will repeat the procedure, do it again. And often in those resistant cases, it's that second procedure that, um, that, really, um, that really gets it done for us. So what else can I do? And this is a very important topic. We've talked about the risks, the symptoms, the advanced therapies that we can provide Patients want to know what they can do to make their condition better. And we have learned in recent years that lifestyle changes and the correctness of lifestyle can have dramatic uh, impact on therapies for atrial fibrillation. Five-fold increase in the success of ablation for atrial fibrillation by modifying risk factors, by adopting a healthy lifestyle and really adhering. And I have slides from Australia because this was studied by a group in Australia who really brought this to our attention. In their ablation procedures, they insisted on a certain weight reduction, blood pressure control, blood sugar control, certain cholesterol profiles had to be within target, 280 plus patients. Those going to ablation for atrial fibrillation and in the group that really maintained that healthy profile, five-fold increase in the success of the procedure. So what you can do is tremendously important, and it improves the benefit that you receive from the therapies that we can provide. And why is that? Because part of your cardiac pathology is, in fact, reversible. And if you remove those aggravating factors that are causing the, the pathology, in fact, your heart will heal. We've even learned that part of the scarring and the fibrosis in the heart can, in fact, reverse itself if you just take away those conditions that were causing it to be present in the first place. It's very exciting, and uh, it's interesting for us. So if you've had an ablation for atrial fibrillation and those problems are still present, those risk factors, the pathology <laughs> continues. But if you've reversed those conditions, then the pathology does not affect the heart post-ablation nearly as much, and it makes the procedure uh, more efficacious. It makes a lot of sense. We've actually proved that it's true, and that's exciting. So we encourage lifestyle. You can avoid triggers, you know, your travel, your stress, your holiday heart. People drink alcohol at holidays, they'll pop into atrial fibrillation. We see them in the emergency room. You can avoid air pollution, stay hydrated, um, cough and cold medications, obviously illicit drugs, can provoke episodes of atrial fibrillation, so you try and stay off the meds if you can. Um, medical procedures, other things that you need done put stresses on your body and predispose to atrial fibrillation. So we try to minimize these things um, towards the goal of controlling this rhythm. You address your comorbid conditions, and we already talked about this, but you're being overweight, high blood pressure, diabetes, sleep apnea, asthma. You want to maintain healthy gums and teeth because unhealthy gums will drive inflammation throughout your system, and that will predispose you to atrial fibrillation. Even joint disease, 
psychological stress, all predisposing your heart to that irritable rhythm, and we try to address these things um, to the degree that it's possible for every one person. We want positive lifestyle changes. I strongly advocate for a Mediterranean diet in my patients, proven to be heart healthy, brain healthy, now bone healthy. Eat until you're 80% full, so don't overeat. You want to exercise you know, 30, 60 minutes, five times a week if you can. You don't have to go to heroics, but it's important that you stay mobile. Restorative sleep, hydration, use filtered water, avoid soda, get a little bit of sunlight on your arms and legs during the summer, 10, 10 to 20 minutes a day can actually be transform transformational. There's no smoking anymore. This is not even a consideration. And you want to abstain or at least minimize uh, your use of alcohol. So the Mediterranean diet cornerstones are raw fruits and vegetables, if you're gonna have meat, when you have meat, it should be a fatty fish like a salmon. There's extra virgin olive oil is the cornerstone of the Mediterranean diet, proven to have a lot of the brain benefit, including preserved memory. Anyone here struggle with their memory? Mediterranean diet can help with that. And then mixed raw nuts, also very important in their cardioprotective effects. Walnuts, I'm sorry, mixed nuts have many of the fatty acids that are found in the fish. It becomes another source for those beneficial things. It's actually the preferred energy substrate for your heart. So when you eat these things, you're giving the heart exactly the form of energy that it wants to do its work, and that decreases electrical irritability and um, helps to keep you in a normal rhythm. I recommend certain supplement regimens, coenzyme Q10, good evidence for it, many examples of success. I take it myself. I've had patients cancel their ablations for atrial fibrillation because they started taking CoQ10. You know, they came back later, but the initial response was good. And it really does help the muscles throughout your body, particularly your heart, use and metabolize energy, which makes those muscles and your heart less irritable, helps predispose you to um, normal rhythm. So things that, things that I'm passionate about, we want friendly exercises, 30 minutes a day, most days of the week should be sort of stretch you, sort of be vigorous, help you relax, be something you look forward to, not that you're suffering from. Walking is absolutely outstanding, low impact on your joints, cardiovascular, stress relieving. If all you do is walk, you are, you're doing everything that you need to do. Jogging, if you're a little bit more ambitious, is also just very fine. Cycling can be a great choice for people who struggle with their joints because it really get off of your joints and you can bike. If you need a stationary bike, it can become a great form of, of activity. Swimming is one of my favorites. Totally unloads your joints if you're having joint conditions. Just being in the water is very um, good for your relaxation. And um, every movement in water faces resistance. So you exercise your whole body just by um, moving in water. You can swim or um, do water aerobics. It's an excellent form of activity. Core training, something I recommend to as many people who will take it on. Pilates or a bar method, have a video. I have these videos at home myself and try to use them. And um, strengthen your core, the central part of your body. It's not your limbs, it's your core. And having that strong core um, is just so vital to your health. And all of these things will be helpful for uh, your atrial fibrillation. So we think of cardiovascular exercise and then resistance training, you know, working out with light weights, lifting books that you have in your house, all forms of resistance training. You don't have to do much to start to experience really um, very good benefit. Doing a little bit is so much better than doing nothing. So if we're not doing some sort of resistance um, training in a very deliberate way, we're robbing ourselves. And that should be part um, of, our, of our exercise regimen. Um, and then on the other flip side of that, the aerobic exercise machines can be, can be very good and give you a whole body workout. And for um, those who can afford them or choose to have them, um, those can be absolutely outstanding. Several books that I've read to learn about practical tips for atrial fibrillation that I would recommend uh, to just about anyone, Keeping Your Heart in Rhythm, Reversing Heart Disease Now with Stephen Sinatra, discusses the rationale behind many of those supplements that I had um, discussed, just really, really very outstanding sources. So we will summarize. We know that atrial fibrillation is common, it's increasing. Symptoms can be palpitations, that heart racing or irregularity flopping in your chest, classic, most common is in fact fatigue, just superimposed on your life, you feel wiped out all the time, that can be atrial fibrillation. We have our management triad. First thing we wanna do is protect you from stroke, and that's anticoagulation. 
Next is when you are having your episodes of atrial fibrillation, we don't want your heart to race, so we slow you down. That's rate control. The next thing, if we can achieve it, and it's different for everybody, is rhythm control. We want to keep you in normal rhythm, not having atrial fibrillation. The rate control medications help with that. We can add the antiarrhythmic medications in, in ways that are appropriate for each person. And failing that or not wanting that, progress to catheter ablation, which is, of course, the gold standard and um, most aggressive and targeted therapy for atrial fibrillation that we have to date. Lifestyle is exceedingly important. We've talked about that. It can make your ablation five times more successful if you will do your best. And our goal is, of course, is to find what's best for you, for each person, because that's different for each person, because we're all unique. Our atrial fibrillation is different. It affects each of us differently. The best therapies for each person are different, and even for a therapy that we choose to pursue, we will do it differently for each person, and we'll assess the response and find you know, our satisfaction in finding the best therapy for, for each one of you and for each of our patients with atrial fibrillation. So it's a, it's a tremendous passion for us.